Um, so good afternoon. Hello, everyone. The Maryland Healthcare Commission thanks you for joining the telehealth policy workgroup today. My name is Ava Lenoir, and also joining me from MHCC um, is David Sharp, Justine Springer, Christine Karinopoulos, and our executive director, Ben Steffen. Um, so due to the number of people on the call today, we will not be conducting individual introductions. MHCC staff uh, will take attendance by recording the names of those attending via the Zoom web link. I'd like to just cover some quick housekeeping items. This meeting is being recorded. The recording will be available on MHCC's telehealth webpage. In the event this meeting is breached, we ask everyone to please hang up immediately. I will send a new meeting link via email to everyone in the distribution list with instructions with how to join the new meeting. Please make sure that you've joined um, the meeting the, either via the web link or by phone. Connect your audio through only one medium to avoid any feedback. All participants will be muted upon entry. You are able to mute and unmute yourself using the small button at the bottom of your screen that looks like a microphone or by entering star six if you're joining by phone. It's best to keep your line muted until you are ready to comment to avoid any unintentional background noise. MHCC staff may mute you if there is a lot of background noise coming through. If you're having any issues with the technology, please email, call, or text Justine. Her e information was included in the email sent earlier this week, and you can also use the chat function to directly message Justine. MHCC staff will sequence participants who wish to speak. Signal to the MHCC team if you would like to speak by using the raise hand icon next to your name and we will call on you. Please be sure to lower your hand once you've commented. Participants are welcome to use the chat function as well. In the event there are too many comments for us to get to all of them during the meeting, these will be reviewed by staff after the meeting. A link to the meeting materials was posted on the workgroup webpage and will be included in the Zoom chat momentarily if you need a copy. If you're joining us by web, the materials will be displayed during the meeting and you should be seeing the agenda now. So I'll pause here to turn it over to David Sharp, which is our Center Director for Health Information Technology and Innovative Care Delivery. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Ava, uh, for kicking us off. Um, so. Um, we're excited today um, for this meeting, this being our fifth meeting of the telehealth policy work group. Um, we're going to present a combination of the ideas that have uh, materialized since our first meeting at the end of September. Uh, we want to step through these policy categories and uh, key uh, messages or key findings, if you will. Um, we're presenting them as um, general findings rather than presenting this as sort of a consensus, de consensus developed document because we recognize that um, you know, the process that we, we embarked on wasn't aimed at trying to reach consensus or a majority, but rather to um, build on ideas and hear the, the concerns and, of the group and then take a bit of a thematic approach to how we pulled out uh, general findings. And we'll share those with you today and, and talk to you a little bit about um, where, we, where we should go from here. And at the same time, uh, we'd like to get your thoughts as well as we touch upon each of these items. Uh, before I get started, I would like to invite our executive director, uh, Mr. Ben Steffen, to uh, make some opening remarks. David, I'm on mute. Okay. Uh, we can hear you, Ben. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Uh, first off, Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you for joining uh, the meeting today. I, uh, uh, since we last uh, talked, we have uh, seen a passage of a major um, new stimulus bill, which has important elements that are going to support the, the fusion of telehealth. Uh, and we look forward to uh, working with our federal partners uh, in seeing that uh, some of that funding uh, comes to Maryland. So uh, please pay attention uh, as uh, the next week or so progress as we sort out uh, how we can be helpful to uh, stakeholders here on the state. Uh, we also have, as uh, we are approaching the start of the legislative session uh, and 
we recognize that the, the, this work group has been um, coming forward. I would be a little more uh, hopeful than David, developing some consensus positions. Uh, my sense is that um, that the legislature will, uh, given the likelihood that it will be limited in many ways, uh, looking to move forward on legislation where all participants have agreed uh, on the approach ahead of time and um, take action on those as, and then set aside issues that are judged more controversial. So I think that's, you know, I think that's important uh, in this space, especially. Um, and as we also consider that telehealth is gonna evolve uh, very uh, quickly, I think over the next uh, several years, as its value has been demonstrated uh, in the pandemic. And even as we, uh, we hopefully over the next nine months exit, uh, many of the biggest challenges, we'll see a greater interest in telehealth uh, generally and greater diffusion on the full uh, capabilities of telehealth uh, broadly as uh, emphasis on broadband and smarter telehealth packages uh, really reach, reach all areas of the state of Maryland. So uh, look forward to our conversation today as well as working with all of the stakeholders over the next 90 days uh, in, in accomplishing uh, uh, initiatives for the benefit of Maryland residents. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Um, so we're gonna jump around a little bit on documents, but hopefully uh, we won't move too fast. And um, the material, as Ava mentioned, is available uh, for today's meeting on our website. But let us start with a little bit of background. So um, Ava, can you bring up the uh, policy discussion items, the information grids as we refer to them internally? Um, let me just add some uh, perspective. For many of you, you'll recall uh, some uh, refresher may be good. Um, what we started out with on the very first meeting in September was to identify what we thought might be key policies for discussion uh, by the participants of this work group. And we identified, we ended up with six of them. Let's just sort of show you what they are for a moment. The first one is removing telehealth restrictions on originating site. Um, Ava, you wanna scroll? All right. <clears throat> The second one is uh, permitting audio only when the treating provider determines it to be safe, effective, and clinically appropriate. Traveling on. Okay. The third policy item for discussion was the removing telehealth restrictions on conditions that can be treated. The fourth removing telehealth restrictions on provider types. The fifth is reducing or waiving cost sharing or telehealth services through the end of the public health emergency or December 31st of 2021, whichever occurs last. And the final policy item that we discussed was reinstating technology standards that require providers to use HIPAA compliant technology, which were relaxed during, which were relaxed by OCR um, during the federal public health emergency. So let's scroll back up to the very first table and just to give you a bit more uh, refresher on what we did. We, we started with identifying uh, the benefits for providers, payers, consumers, and then the unintended consequences for providers, payers, and consumers. So we broke it out by, largely by stakeholder. And then we moved on to what we call the permanency concerns. What might be um, some of the obstacles or, um, or concerns that uh, the stakeholders might have as it relates to um, making permanent some of these policies. And we collected information uh, during the meetings and electronically following the meetings from the stakeholders. And then we said, well, what doesn't fit into these three different categories or these three buckets, if you will? Let's figure out what they are and let's record them. So we did that. And again, you can see here on this first policy question or policy statement, uh, what we recorded. 
And then what we did was as a group, we synthesized um, all those comments for each one of these policy statements and called them primary themes. It was attempt to sort of group what could be a, a, a factor of all the, the stakeholders, both concerns, um, benefits and unintended consequences. And then um, from there, we took that and said, okay, we think we're pretty much narrowed this list down. So let's come up with some general findings, taking the primary themes and saying, what are some of the key points here? You know, the idea isn't to have a list of 20 for each policy category, but rather a few that summarize general findings. And I think um, to uh, articulate what Ben mentioned is this is our opportunity to come up with some general consensus about areas we think make sense and areas that we think requires um, further discussion later on. So what we're going to do today, um, now that you've seen some of the evolution of where we got to, we're gonna show you a different document that includes the primary themes and general findings for each one of these policy categories. And the purpose here is, is to not have a cluttered screen because sometimes it's a little difficult to, to work through information when there's too much uh, that you're staring at, but we can jump back and forth if necessary. Um, so Ava, can you scroll down a little bit? So um, in this, oh, it's a little too far. So in this section, we talked about what this is. We talked about the background, you know, just a, at a quick glance, a summary of you know, how we got here, why we're here. And we do note that um, to Ben's point, where as much as possible, we'd like to get consensus. We recognize that um, for each one of these items to this point, we've not asked for um, everyone to, if you will, you know, vote of any sort of structure, but merely to recognize that we may have more consensus than what we think, but at the same time, um, identify where there's uh, potential for uh, or need for additional discussion. So we started with um, each one of these policy categories. And I will note here that in, in brackets, you will see on several of these that we're going to talk about today, that um, it includes the phrase included in MHA proposed legislation. On the Maryland General Assembly's website, there is a draft legislation that will be introduced, I believe, as early as next week. Um, and there's, it already has a hearing date, at least on the Senate side, a bill that was proposed by um, the Maryland Hospital Association. Ava, can you pull that up just real quick and so everyone can see um, this bill? Again, it is available on the Maryland uh, General Assembly's website. Um, it's called Preserve Telehealth Access Act of 2021. And um, what we have done is pulled elements from that, but where the bill touches our policy categories. And so if it's included in the bill, we've noted it in the, the discussion that we'll have. And you can see the uh, senators who introduced it. And then if you're interested in the cross file um, component on the House side, it too is on the um, Maryland General Assembly website. So uh, we've also uh, put this in the information package that you can download from our website if you're interested in doing that either, either at some point today or later on. So let's go back to the Word document that we were looking at just a moment ago and uh, talk about where we are. So um, we'll scroll down just a little bit further. And on the first item, it's the um, the key policy category, the statement is removing telehealth restrictions on an originating site. And as I mentioned, this is included in the proposed legislation. And uh, the general findings that uh, come from the primary themes and the discussion of the work group um, over the last five, five meetings, four meetings, this is our fifth meeting today, um, center around A and B. So let me just sort of um, highlight them and then we'll, we'll talk a bit. So the, the thinking around removing telehealth restrictions on originating site was to um, collect and analyze data to inform policy development. And this bullet point, an analysis of government and private payer data collected, for example, value, cost, access, and quality during the public health emergency is needed to inform policy discussions to ensure recommendations are prudent and data informed. And the second bullet point drawn from the primary themes um, reads 
allowing existing telehealth, state telehealth waivers, policy flex and policy flexibilities where feasible to remain in effect until some period after the end of the DHA. Now, the other component that the work group talked about was to uh, modify the definition of the originating site to recognize any patient setting where care can be delivered based on a consumer needs and preferences and provider clinical judgment and guidelines on health, safety, and security. And this subcomponent here is expanding permissible care delivery sites of telehealth services helps address care access gaps in rural, vulnerable, and underserved population, populations. And some of that comes out, you'll see if you, when you read the uh, bill, Senate bill um, that was that's due to be released uh, or discussed in a hearing on the 27th, I believe. So um, let us just sort of show you the themes. We won't we wanted to include them in the document, but just give you a sense of what they were. And I'm just gonna pause a moment to allow everyone to read them as opposed to reading them for you. And again, what we weren't trying to do is have a one-to-one -one relationship, but more or less say, you know, this is what you, one would rationally conclude um, in terms of the, recommend, the general findings from um, these themes. So, um, Ava, let's scroll back up to the general theme. And I want to also um, mention to the group that letter A that you see here, where um, the analysis of government and private payer data is needed um, to really ensure that the recommendations are prudent and data informed, that will show up in a number of these general findings as it seemed to be a message that carried from uh, the primary themes on uh, many of the other um, policy categories. So I'm gonna pause here and see if there are any reactions um, to A and B as they present themselves at the moment. And um, you can um, either use the hand function or um, if there's anyone that wants to just weigh in, um, you know, please feel free to speak up at the moment. Okay. Um, so um, let me just ask a few folks to see if the, sometimes silence isn't always an agreement. Sometimes silence is just silence. Um, I think Deb Rifkin, you're on. I believe you're on. I, you're muted, uh, but any, are you able to weigh in? <clears throat> Hi, David. Can you hear me? We can. Good afternoon. <clears throat> you know, I, I got to spend a little bit more time thinking about this. Um, I think all along we have argued that in order for us to really figure out what makes most sense, we need to collect and analyze data. Um, and um, I like the fact uh, that you're going to be looking across payers. I think that's important because I think a lot of the conversations have been about certain groups we've heard about um, Medicaid or sometimes seniors don't have access to certain things. So I think it'll be helpful to see what's happening in those different markets. Um, you're looking at broad-based things, I think, for, for the whole spectrum, like value, cost, access, and quality. All those things are really imperative to be looked at. So it's a balanced approach. Um, and certainly, we would agree, I'm just looking at the words, that a data-informed policy makes most sense. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with number two too. I got to think about that a little bit more about what that truly means. Um, but I certainly do agree that if you're going to do an analysis, you need a decent amount of time to look at data and make sure you've got enough data to make a good policy decision. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Deb. Uh, Dr. Berman, any thoughts? 
Yeah, well, we certainly, the Maryland Psychological Association certainly supports um, uh, allowing um, originating site to be, um, in, as language says here, any patient setting where care can be delivered based upon uh, their needs, consumers' needs and preferences. Um, I know that I had a, just had a call with the American Psychological Association and uh, what I was told is that CMS um, is in the process of uh, changing originating site uh, requirements um, in Medicare to allow um, just what we're talking about. Um, uh, originating site can be um, someone's home, um, office, or any other location where both consumer and uh, professional believe it's appropriate. Um, and, and obviously, uh, collecting data is critical and will help inform any, any discussions. But the idea of having originating site um, uh, and, and expansion of that, um, uh, I believe, and we believe, is critical to um, uh, consistency of patient care and continuity of care. Uh, thank you. And I, you're uh, referring to a CMMS, CMS uh, proposed rule that came out in August and uh, closed in, um, excuse me, came out in August and closed in October, uh, where um, it, as a proposed rule, they were seeking comments. And that is one of the components that were, was included in, um, in that notice for comments by CMS. Um, so um, Dr. Hughes, um, be curious to get your thoughts. Hi there. Um, yeah, I think Rebecca may be on as well. Um, and speaking from Hopkins, I think particularly B here is is part of what we've advocated for um, in kind of seeing how revolutionary it's been to have the um, home originating site available across payers. Um, because it, previous to COVID, it was very difficult for our health system to offer services if it was if they weren't broadly available to patients across different payers. So. I think to us, this is the, the most equitable way to ensure that uh, every population would have access in their homes. Thank you. Um, Richard Block, good afternoon. Good afternoon, David. I, I would si simply concur. I think, you know, there's no question that we need to expand the ability across uh, originating sites. So maybe I'll take the bold steps since I think um, challenged by um, our executive director to get to have a needle that ideally the needle leads more towards consensus as opposed to in the middle. Is there anyone, can anyone who might feel strongly that um, the general findings for this policy um, discussion item that they would say, oh, I just, you know, frankly, they're, it, they're unsettling and we don't, you know, as a stakeholder or as a consumer, um, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying these are, you know, these represent me or my stakeholder. Um, anyone out there that might be willing to step out on that branch? Um, not, not, well, so David, it, it, this is Trisha Roddy. I, I, I probably think, um, you know, this is really, um, this language, it sounds as though in the discussions is mostly targeted at Medicaid policy because we, we ha we've had some restrictions around originating sites. Um, and, and I've said pretty consistently, you know, we've removed it during the pandemic and we're, we're very committed to moving forward and making sure that, um, that, it can, that we remove the restrictions after the pandemic. So we're committed to that. I, I will put a little footnote on that, um, that there are um, some federal rules that will prohibit us doing this um, uh, completely with clinics. Um, so there is what's called um, a four walls requirement at the federal level where they've, and they've uh, allowed states to get a temporary waiver during the pandemic around what's termed as the four walls requirement. And to be really, to, to summarize, the four walls requirement means in order to get the Medicaid clinic rate that either the provider or the individual has to be within the four walls of um, the facility. 
Um, this is something that they said will probably not continue after the pandemic. Um, so, so for example, this would apply to FQHCs. Um, so the, the individual could be uh, in their home setting, but that would mean that the provider would have to be within the FQHC in order to bill the clinic rate, have to bill um, our normal professional fees. Um, so there are some um, nuances within the Medicaid program where we couldn't say absolutely in every circumstance we could agree to this language of being so broad. That's certainly understood. That's very helpful. And uh, thank you for that feedback and for joining us today, Tricia. Um, so anybody else before we move along? Uh, David, Dr. Bandari has his hand raised. Uh, Dr. Bandari, you're muted, by the way. Uh, I think. I think you're self-muted, so. Uh... What about now? We have Can you. you hear me? Yes, indeed. We hear you. Wait, so uh, yeah, I, I still have a little bit uh, need clarification for originating site, actually. Trisha clarified to a certain extent. So my thinking was, is originating site for the patient or the provider? because some of the providers right now are providing care, not only from the office due to the limited space, some of the providers are doing care from the home also. And that's one thing. Second is for the patients, you know, if the patient has to be in the four walls, as Trisha mentioned, or the patient can be in their car in the parking lot or somewhere else. So those things are still, you know, not very clarified to the providers as well as the patients. Um, that's helpful to hear. Um, so thank you, Dr. Bandari. Um, okay. Um, and Ava, you're capturing this behind the screen scenes, correct? If you could, I'm sorry, what? If you could just be recording this as, 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 rather than showing it on screen, if you could just be capturing these comments as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you. So I, I did have a question for Tricia. Uh, what you referenced were the, the, the provider sites, or were you specifically talking about the originating site would be uh, in your particular, uh, um, was that for the originating site or was that for the distance site? So, so again, I think um, under the pandemic, the way that it's been operating, and I think the language in the bill is, um, uh, it, it opens it up, not just order to originating site that the provider can be wherever they, um, uh, um, that, that they can practice wherever they need to be. Um, if I remember the language correctly. Um, so again, uh, you know, it, it, the person can be in their home setting to get the clinic rate, the FQHC rate, um, but the provider has to be within the four walls. Uh, we know during the um, pandemic that some providers have been home delivering um, services. Um, and so that would not be allowed and still be able to bill a clinic rate and the FQHC rate. One or the other needs to be in the clinic. And I would note for um, the point Dr. Bandari raised that uh, that it does not, in the bill, just so in Senate Bill 3, it does not require, if, or said differently, the distance site provider can be at any location. It doesn't spell out the location setting type, if you will. So to Dr. Bondari's part, if you're working from home and you're the distance site provider, that is not that is not called out as it can't happen under the Senate bill. It's it says it can be at any location. Because it's going to create some issue. I know many of my colleagues, uh, physicians, they are helping patients even after hours, you know, after they go home or over the weekend. If they have to come to the clinic, they will not provide this care. Well, I think they are open like 24 seven, you know, they are very much open. I would say 16 hours a day for the, during the pandemic and a lot of time, you know, um, they are here to help the people. Understood. 
Thank you. So again, I, the only thing I'll, I'll say is that um, it is very, we do know that we are on, we're currently under the pandemic paying for our, uh, telehealth within an FQHC that would not be allowed once the four walls requirement goes away. I understand. Yes. I <clears throat> okay. Um, so anyone else with comment at this point, or we will uh, we'll move forward. Okay. Um, hearing none. Um, Ava, do you want to scroll down a little bit? So the, the second key policy category is permitting, oh, permitting audio only when the treating provider determines it to be safe, effective, and clinically appropriate. And here again, I'll note that in the Senate bill, this, you know, this legislation is, is, is included. Um, so to the general findings, you'll find that A appears here as well as it did on the very first key policy category. So I, I won't um, spend time reading it. Um, on B, it it's talks about support greater state and federal telecommunications infrastructure investment in less resource communities and healthcare facilities to greater access and use of telehealth. And the subcomponent from the primary themes talks about um, different rural areas lacking sufficient broadband to support um, greater diffusion of telehealth. So um, let me pause here as well and um, see if there are some general comments from the group as it relates to um, the, the general findings here for this particular policy question. Okay, um, let's just invite a few folks. It's always good to do. Um, so, um, Allison Taylor, are you able to weigh in? I am, yeah. Um, let me take a close look at this now. Um, certainly agree that uh, government and private payer data uh, collected is needed to ensure the data, is, the recommendations are data informed. Um, if you're looking specifically at the um, the the item B, uh, we certainly would would support the idea that many rural areas lack sufficient broadband access, um, and think it's important that the state move towards uh, improving broadband access. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Pagin Towson. Are you um, able to unmute? Sure, David. Um, Good afternoon. I, um, I, I'm a little unclear, is permitting audio only, only after this data analyst analysis? So great question. So originally the, the thinking of the work group when it started to convene back in September was, you know, let's, let's get more data to inform the policy development and do the analysis. So um, one of the activities that the, our, the MHCC was, is planning to undertake is to do more of a data analysis and, uh, and assess the effectiveness of telehealth during the pandemic. Um, we plan to do that. Our aiming point is to begin that work later, late in the spring or early summer. And the, the, the thinking of the work group was this would inform future decision making. And in the meantime, it seemed like there were some in the legislature that thought that um, why don't we go ahead and move this forward um, in this session and at the same time still complete some of the background work. And yet to be determined is whether or not there's a sunset provision included in, in any sort of legislation that would move forward that essentially just is extending the um, the work that's permissible or the care that's permissible under the public health emergency until um, such time, there are a period of time after the public health emergency. We still don't know how that will land, but I, I think it's a little of both. It is, it is, there's a bill out there now that says, hey, maybe this is possible. We, the legislature should consider doing it today. And at the same time, there's the assumption that there'll be some need for additional information 
to inform future policy decision making. And that's where the general findings ended up. So um, I adamantly support permitting audio only to continue, um, both from our Medicaid plan perspective, because it is very helpful um, in communicating with our Medicaid patients, and also from a rural perspective when they don't have broadband. So there are a lot of uses for this, and I would hate to have our providers fall and our patients fall off a cliff once the, the pandemic is, is over. Um, I think we need to permit audio only, and if you want to study it, that's fine, but I think it's made the case. Um, consumers very much like it. It improves access, and I think it's a very valuable tool um, that, that we should continue to be able to use. Okay. Um, thank you for that feedback. Um, Jim, um, Jim Gutman, from the yes. perspective. Uh uh, well, AARP in Maryland in general is, is supportive of any measures that improve access. This audio only clearly improves access, so we do want to see it available uh, to as many people as we can and as soon as it can be. Okay, um, and I think I wanted to bring on, um, go, I'm going to go back to, to Dr. Hughes. Um, I, can you weigh in here? Absolutely. Um, we've been doing some work uh, looking at of different populations, um, the percent of all telemedicine visits that are phone versus video. And we're definitely seeing in certain population, including patients who are over 65, patients who are non-English speaking, um, racial ethnic minority patients, certain zip codes um, with uh, different um, access levels, that those populations are more dependent on the audio only care. Um, for instance, those over 75 at our health system have had about 35% of telemedicine visits as phone only versus um, kind of the, the 20 to 40 year olds has been more like 5%. So um, we feel similarly to the home originating site issue that it, it is sort of an access issue, um, particularly for patients that may attempt a video visit, but have it be not successful due to limited broadband. Um, it's great for, that they'd still be able to get their health care. David, this is Matt Celentano from the League of Life and Health Insurers, and yeah. I just want to point out, just for clarity purposes, that some of the discussion has, uh, in the last couple of minutes have been about older populations, and anything this group sort of recommends for anybody over 65, we're not going to impact any of that. Um, they're going to be Medicare patients, and nothing that this work group can do can influence any of that. So just for level setting purposes, just wanted to point that out. Fair enough. Good, good point to illustrate. Um, Pam, are you Pam Casemeyer? Um, any thoughts here? Are you uh, calling on Ann Horton? Sorry, sorry, I, sorry. Oh, oh it's, it's, it's Pam. I, I, I was having trouble getting unmuted. Um, oh, okay. So there is no doubt that um, the physician community, um, the federally qualified health center community, um, the behavioral health community all have found that the use of tele of audio only is an incredibly useful and important um, uh, com or, um, modality, especially for certain populations as has already been spoken to. So we, we do understand the need to continue to evaluate data. We understand the need that it has to be clinically appropriate, that we can't be duplicating services um, and that there are issues there um, to discuss, but we are concerned not knowing the length of time that the public health emergency may be in place that if we wait too long to address this, we'll lose this modality unnecessarily um, <laughs> while we're doing our evaluation. Understood, good point, thank you. Um, Ann, I, were you going to make a point? Ann Horton? Um, yeah, hi, I did think you were calling on me, so um, that's why I <laughs> spoke up. But I, I do wanna say that, um, you know, on behalf of MNCA, the Home Care Association for Maryland, um, you know, we're, we're very supportive of the, and, and agree with the need for additional payer data. I'm suspicious about when we will have access to that and how this timeline lurk, uh, looks vis-a-vis -vis the, um, uh, end of the public health emergency and the waivers. 
Um, but in general, I would say, you know, the notes that we're reviewing today were supportive of. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, so uh, Deborah Steinberg would be, would be interested in your perspective as a consumer member. Hi, sorry, I'm having connectivity issues. I'll type in the chat. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Um, is there um, Ellen, Ellen Weber, can you weigh in here? Yeah, thanks, David. I sure can. Um, we would agree with what others have said in terms of the importance of moving forward with this policy, um, not knowing again when the public health emergency is going to end and just the absolute critical um, uh, role that audio only has played for all the populations that have already been identified. I want to identify that we know that telehealth has been very critical in reducing appointment no-shows and retaining patients in um, mental health and substance use disorder programs. And at this critical time when the epidemic is creating such an increased need for mental health and substance use services, we would, I think, be, be obviously um, doing a, a, an injustice to Marylanders by removing this modality of access to care. We've also been speaking with various providers who've been doing both audio visual as well as audio only. And over the course of the pandemic, they have done a tremendous amount of work to adjust to providing services, both audio visually and audio only. And they find that those are services that they can deliver in the same way as in-person services, if need be. They agree that patients are going to make the decision as to what works best for them. And so we do want to ensure that the consumer's voice is taken into consideration as much as the treating provider's voice in your, you know, in your overarching theme. But we would agree entirely uh, with this. And we also would like, when you begin to do that data analysis, to obviously, you're the experts in this, but to do it on as granular a basis as possible to in fact being able to um, suss out the different conditions that are being treated via telehealth and again, the different modalities. Um, we again have noted with care, with fair health data that telehealth is being, you know, is the majority is, you know, telehealth claims, um, the majority of those services are behavioral health claims and not other medical services. So we are very interested in learning what the experience in Maryland has been. Okay, very good point. Thank you. Uh, one more, Dr. Trump. David? Yes. Hey, it's, sorry, it's Robin. I've had my hand up and just oh. wanted to make a uh, point whenever, before sure. we wrap up this section. Sure. Uh, why don't you proceed? And before doing so, um, Dr. Trumbull, we would uh, be interested in your thoughts after Robin has a chance to speak. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, I, I think the one piece of this, and I you know, certainly uh, agree with uh, much of what's been said here, but uh, especially under B is, I guess, where my my attention goes, uh, and for obvious reasons here on the shore, we we have certainly lots of issues around this. But I think a, a big piece of this is that as practitioners and, and physicians in the area, we certainly would prefer to have video at the very least. Obviously, you'd love to have them in person, but that's really not an. an a, a, there's lots of patients that just don't have that capability because they. They lack not only the infrastructure of telemedicine, but they lack the transportation to even get to the offices. Um, and and to be perfectly honest, we if we didn't have that, we would certainly prefer video. But it, we've run into that same issue, and and this this problem with the infrastructure is going to exist well past uh, this pandemic. And I mean, we're talking, you know, probably five to ten years before we really have the infrastructure, and we. We need something to bridge that gap that is of, of, of significant enough to provide us the information that we need to, to make some clinical decisions. And, and for that matter, I think we need, that's why we need audio support here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Robin. Yeah. Thanks, David. So what, what I think is also super important, and I, I agree with a lot of the other um, uh, people who commented that I think always it's good to study and analyze. I think it's uh, a mistake for access to delay um, continuing the audio only policy um, while we wait on kind of a longer term study. But one thing I think it's really important to look at when we think about doing analysis is the importance of where the consumer is and their preferences. And by preference, I don't mean just a superficial 
um, whether or not they like it or they don't. I think we know that unless consumers feel like it's a um, type of healthcare uh, that's in, they can engage in and that they feel comfortable, that they won't get health care. So that consumer preference really drives whether or not that consumer is able to connect in, uh, to the healthcare system. And so I don't see in here um, anything related to really looking at where is the consumer and what is it that they want. Okay, okay. thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, before we move on, I, I'd be curious to, to I think the, the general consensus is the needle means a bit more to that as a policy um, consideration, um, you know, as a category that there is um, the general findings that are here seem adequate. So I would, if there's anyone that feel comfortable saying you know, if they are, if there is any real opposition to the general findings here, um, please feel free I think we're in a pretty much in a good, solid group that's comfortable sharing. Uh, let us know that, and otherwise we'll travel along to the next uh, Can I? Category. Hi, this is Monty Ross from the Maryland Hospital Association. I do want to just chime in real quick. Apologies for raising my hand a little bit later. Um, no you know where you are, David. But I, I, I want to just echo the the points that have been made around the need for um, continuing these services. Just you know not wanting to create a gap, uh, particularly for most vulnerable, if we lose the PAG. And we know that, you know, um, uh, the legislative session is only so long. I uh, appreciate you raising our, our bill. Um, I think we would have been happy to share more information on it had we know we were going to talk through this. And, and I know there's a bunch of other bills also um, in the telehealth space. I know from the provider standpoint that providers have been working um, really, you know, hard to um, gather data on the use of telehealth during the pandemic. And we've seen um, such good outcomes in the spaces of patient satisfaction and patient engagement and um, continuity of care. And I'm curious about this point are related to um, data analysis from the payer standpoint. I mean, we've been under a, a health emergency since um, March. So, you know, almost uh, coming up to a year now. And I think the payer started really early on uh, creating some of these flexibilities early in March and, and April. So um, I, you know, I haven't participated in the last few meetings. I was on maternity leave, but I don't know if, um, you know, if we've seen some of that analysis already. And, and if not, what's really preventing that from happening quicker? Um, because we've had, again, some of these flexibilities in place for several months. That's a good question. So the general thinking is, is uh, more data is better, but to your point, when is it, when do you have enough? Um, we haven't, as the MHC, taken it upon to look at data across the payers. Um, and to some extent, um, the data is still being compiled and what, nine months into this, uh, a number of the payers have said, you know, that's just not enough time to get a critical mass of data to really be telling. Um, so that was the general thinking of why um, a bit more time is needed to collect data. And what we had talked internally about is if we started this work in the spring um, or even early part of the summer, there would be much more data that's amassed over the next several months that could help inform any type of uh, policies that were to emerge later on. So um, that was the thinking behind uh, the, the general finding that you see. David, this is this is Trisha Roddy again. I'll, I'll just uh, make a couple of points here. Um, so one of the things that um, we we need to it will impact Medicaid um, is Medicare is covering audio only right now. They have come out and said they are not going to continue covering audio only. They've developed a, a temporary, you know, after the pandemic ends till the end of the year, they have a check in code. Um, that they put in place to help providers with that transition. The reality of Medicare not covering um, audio only um, will impact Medicaid for those individuals who are covered under both programs, both Medicare and Medicaid. So uh, if Medicare ends up denying these audio only services, instead of us paying a 20% co-insurance rate, which we normally do, um, we become the primary payer. 
So that means that we are now paying 100% um, of those costs. So this is a, a, is a, is a huge impact to Medicaid. We, we are trying to estimate what those costs could potentially be, but obviously it's not in the data right now because Medicare is covering it. And this isn't something that we're gonna be able to um, show in, in, our, in, in the data that we've collected to date. Um, so again, this is a real concern for Medicaid. Um, you know, obviously, um, we, we have no control over over where Medicare is, except to continue to lobby at the federal level. Um, but it also applies to commercial carriers as well. That if they do deny um, claims for uh, for for reasons like um, if the service was provided um, audio only. It, it, it modality that um, Medicaid would then become the primary payer. And we all don't want that to happen, right? Um, that's not something that we want to see happening. It's cost shifting onto the Medicaid program from commercial carriers or, or Medicare. That's not, not the goal in this. So, um, so again, that's why data and spending a bit more time with this is critical or at least allowing um, payers um, the flexibility to make adjustments based on um, budget reasons or others. Um, so, um, so again, what, it, it's really important to understand this. Yeah, and um, Abe is capturing this and we're also recording. So we'll come back to make sure we have um, good adequate notes. And uh, Tricia is talking a little bit about um, what exists today under, under Medicare. They have what's called a, um, communications telehealth based category excuse me a telehealth telecommunication based services area where virtual visits are, um, are are included so they they actually don't and their proposed rule have um, audio only but they're proposing that under the virtual visits it's it's a form of it so I think that's what um, it's part of what Trish is mentioning under the Medicare you know, rule um, and over. and I, th I think David, if I could interrupt you here, I think you know we can't lose sight of uh, a fact, uh, and I've tried to emphasize this that I think if we want uptake on telehealth, either defined um, narrowly or broadly, we really need to figure out um, how we can develop a, a consistent definition across both commercial and government payers. Um, I would hope that the check-in code that CMS has suggested they would use would continue after the pandemic, but that's something that we would, uh, I think we need to watch carefully because that might be a framework for, um, uh, for continuing audio um, once the um, PHE ends uh, in a consistent way across all payers that would provide greater clarity to the provider community on, I don't need to worry about payer status because I know this uh, is always gonna be permitted. Yeah, that's a great point, Ben. I, I guess the, the question that um, requires more thinking amongst everybody as, they're, as they sort of watch the, um, the legislature with, with the bills that we know they're in the shoot or, um, or anything that's new that we don't know is that Whatever, we, whatever gets locked down around audio only, if it's locked down and all of a sudden the rules change in terms of what CMS is doing, you know, how does that impact everything else? And should there, be, um, should there be a phased approach or opportunities for something else to happen in legislation if there's a general thinking that legislating for audio only is something that, that should happen yeah. now? Uh, Dr. Hughes made a point about Medicaid uh, being a higher percentage uh, audio only uh, compared to commercial. But I did, uh, you know, our, the data we have seen, uh, and it's restricted to Medicare here in the state uh, or information nationally, uh, does suggest that the, there's been a you know, pretty dramatic fall off uh, on telehealth generally, but on, in audio only, uh, and I, I don't know if that is just the uh, the uniqueness of the data sets that we have uh, and the information sources that have been available to us, but curious, Dr. Hughes, if you have any insight uh, 
that would shed further light on that. Do you mean over time? Yeah. Yeah, I can, um, that is for all of our visits over the past nine months. I can try to look um, here for like maybe the past two months. Um, I will chat it. It's just gonna take me a little bit to try to- that, That's okay. I mean, I think we, I understand you know, how strongly people feel about audio only, uh, but it does make me worry that you know, we're uh, trying to figure out, you know, how we build a, a faster a horse cart in 20, 2000 or 19, 1910 when automobiles were soon going to um, replace horses altogether. Uh, it's, it's vital during the pandemic. Uh, it could be necessary uh, post pandemic, but it's really not what any of us would say uh, is the best uh, framework for delivering telehealth. Uh, into the future and you know, while we all recognize the importance of access, uh, I'm not um, of the opinion that we want to support uh, in any way the development of a two-tiered system where those that are young, uh, more affluent or, um, or more technically savvy get one higher level of care uh, and everyone else you know, struggles along with um, a lower level of care. And I know, I absolutely know it. that's not anyone's intention, but we can't lose sight of the fact that um, if we're talking about telehealth, we're still talking about breaking down barriers uh, to uh, the full gamut of technology to, promote, to enable its use. Um, well, thank you everyone for weighing in. David, can I, this is Matt Chalantano. Can I just take a little, another little bite at the apple before we move on? Oh, just because there's a, a very good discussion around data and I just want to sort of discuss sort of the problems with data and the um, sort of unintended consequences of data if we only look at a skewed portion of this pandemic and if we are only looking at that massive rise then we're legislating for something that is a crisis and not for where the normalization will come back to us and it is no, there is no way that carriers are sort of slow walking data. That is not the case. We've just seen, we have responded to a crisis that we've never seen before. And also there's going to be a lag sometimes because providers and hospitals have months and months and months to get us the claim in the first place. So there are built in, uh, you know, bump buffers here that have to be sort of accounted for. But what we want to do, I think everybody on this call wants to do is find the correct policy to serve the people of Maryland for the long term not to just respond to a public health emergency where we have all scattered to try to fit the moment and respond to that moment. And I think people have, um, but we're not talking about that moment now. We're talking about future healthcare policy in telehealth. And it's important to keep that sort of in context. Yeah, and I think, um, thank you for that, Matt. Uh, and I think from what we're hearing and we've heard from past meetings of the work group and even from those stakeholders who have reached out to us independently, is just that there's there's a need to allow what exists to exist for some period of time. Um, there's there's differences in views on should it be forever or should there be you know, a glide path to, as Ben mentioned, some standard around the use of technology that doesn't create an unintended consequences of having a, a multi-tiered system. And I think we're moving closer in that direction of figuring out what it should look like. And the good news is everybody thinks what's there today should continue at least for some period of time, if not indefinitely. So I think we're moving in the right direction as a group of stakeholders. And, and I don't think today is necessarily the day to say um, what that time frame should be, but I think it's a, it is clearly is a general finding that there's support for um, using audio only for the time being. And, you know, there'll, be differences in terms of what that time being should should look like. And I think we, we hear that and that we appreciate everyone's concern and perspective around that. Okay, um, so um, well, let's travel along. Um, Ava, let's go to the third key policy discussion item. And um, that is removing telehealth restrictions on conditions that can be treated Again, I'll note in SB 
three, that, that is included. Um, the general findings under A remain the same um, that you've seen in the, in the prior two um, different general findings on the policy categories. Uh, we do have a different B and C. So let me just highlight and you all can read um, the elements of it. But in general, from the removing telehealth restrictions on conditions, um, there's the, the general thinking of educating consumers on telehealth and services that are appropriate to receive as um, not all services um, are most appropriate to deliver um, using that technology. And then uh, moving along here, there's some need to adopt uniform behavioral health telehealth use policies to improve access. And that was also a general finding from the primary themes. So um, let me pause for a moment and invite um, Ellen uh, Weber to uh, respond. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, I, I would like just a little bit more information about um, your C point in terms of, I guess it's just not coming to mind right now in terms of, of, of what that means precisely. I mean, we agree that there need to be uniform policies put in place. We need to ensure that all the policies that are put in place for behavioral health services are in compliance with the Parity Act so that there is no discrimination in terms of the delivery of these services vis-a-vis -vis medical services. So that's very important. We do note that under current Medicaid standards, there are prior authorization requirements that aren't compliant with the Parity Act. Um, and so I guess that those are what's coming to my mind initially and would be very interested in hearing a little bit more about what you're, what you're referring to there. So essentially, that was some of the conversation from the general uh, group and the primary themes. Um, it, is a, a, it is quite a bit of what you've just stated, that they're having consistency across uh, payers is important um, as it relates to the use of uh, telehealth for behavioral health care. And um, that's really the underlying framework. And, and we would completely agree with you on that. I mean, I guess I, the one thing I do want to say is that, again, as we've already talked about, using Medicare as, the, as a benchmark for what's happening in the state with regard to commercial insurance and Medicaid, I understand Chris's points entirely. At the same time, there are standards under Medicare right now that are, are much more um, uh, expansive for some of these services, but for me mental health and substance use services, uh, than somatic services as well. Um, but again, I'm not sure that Medicare is the right benchmark for this one, obviously, um, because in the Medicare context, there is still, in, for many levels of care, a lack of coverage entirely for substance use disorder care and to a lesser degree, mental health services. Yeah. So I do get very concerned about using that as a as a measure of what we can do in Medicaid and commercial insurance. Good point. Thank you. Um, Sally Ann Alborn, are you able to weigh in? Yes, David. Good afternoon. Pardon me? Uh, we can hear you. I'm, ha I'm having difficulty hearing you. Oh, OK. Well, um, are you able to weigh in here? And well, the only comment I had was that I just want to be sure that what we do for behavioral health is consistent with what we're doing for somatic health. And that the, that the, the coverage and the reimbursement, the access um, is on par and that there aren't any uh, restrictions uh, or limitations placed on behavioral health that wouldn't be um, on somatic health. That's my concern. Yeah, no, good point. Um, Dr. Lawson? Yes, sorry, that, sorry about that, David. Yeah, I've been listening in and pretty much agreeing with um, the comments that everyone has said. and. Um, 
in reading the summary there, I think in terms of rehab, um, definitely, you know, all of these points apply to rehab services. I did have one question, um, which I was just kind of assuming was already taken care of, but maybe I'll go ahead and say it anyway, just to make sure that the data that is collected to inform the decision making, that it is really inclusive of the rehab services as well, and not really just focusing on behavior health or, um, you know, medical types of services, those kinds of things. Yeah, that's but, um, great, that it's that's inclusive a, that way. Yeah, that's a great point, and that was the thinking as well. Mm -hmm. um, are there any um, any concerns that uh, we haven't talked about here for this particular key category that um, we should we should note or could be aired at this point before we move along? Hey, David. It's Lori Doyle. Hello, Lori. How are you? Good. Uh, just to make a point that I think is one that we have to keep in mind across the board, there's been often questions and discussion about, does this apply to Medicaid? Does it apply to commercial? You know, where are we drawing those lines? And I think we have to be careful to remember that commercial and Medicare and Medicaid serve very different populations. Their needs are different. And when you look at the plans themselves, uh, for instance, in behavioral health, the Medicaid um, uh, benefits package is much more robust than anything you'll find in the commercial market. So I just wanted to, to raise the point that when we're, we're making these policies and when we're looking at things like, for instance, the discussion we just had on audio only, we're talking about an impoverished group of people that don't have the resources and the transportation and the access that people in the commercial market tend to have. And so even though we may want consistency and equivalency, um, they may not be, um, that may not be the same as applying the same thing to all payers. Understood. Fair point. Um, thank you. David, I, I would echo what, you know, Lori just said too, in terms of behavioral health um, and, and include don't have the technology and broadband access that others do. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Um, so let's go on, Ava, um, to the fourth category. Okay, and here, this one is removing telehealth restrictions on provider types, and that too is included in SB3, um, again, available um, in the material distributed today and, of course, on the Maryland General Assembly's website. So um, I remind everyone that what's in A is a reoccurring theme, um, and let's scroll down a little bit, um, Ava. And here in B, um, just to highlight it, it's allow licensed healthcare providers to treat using telehealth within the scope of practice based on consumer preference. And this gets back to a point we heard, I think uh, Robin, uh, Robin will um, make, Robin Elliott made a little while ago. Um, it's, and Jim Goodman, as well as uh, provider clinical judgment and existing guidelines on health, safety, and security. And I've actually heard from some of this from um, different payers as well. So this is the general, a general theme or finding from the work group. And um, there are some benefits uh, noted under B, which were also emerging and have emerged as part of the general findings. And um, it is need for um, broadband access in order to reduce um, hospital admissions, readmissions, and emergency department utilization. And then um, the use of telehealth helps with addressing provider shortages. So a couple of key points. Um, uh, do you want to scroll up just a little bit, Ava, so everyone can see the, the general heading? Okay. So with that, uh, let me invite uh, some folks to weigh in. Um, so um, let's start with um, Lori Doyle. Lori, are you able to weigh in? Okay, uh, maybe not. So um, I'm sorry, David. It took me a while to get to the um, the button. Um, and so I, I do think it's important to. Um, remove restrictions on provider types. Um, again, particularly in behavioral health, we have, and I'm speaking largely to the Medicaid world, more so than the commercial world, 
um, but we have a variety of clinicians um, that, that practice and we want to make sure that anyone from any, you know, um, distant site can uh, provide telehealth because it usually takes a team effort to really get the best of outcomes uh, for people. So, you know, in our world, we operate in outpatient clinics and they have multiple disciplines uh, that work together for the purpose of good patient um, care. So I would say to the extent that we can um, do this and be as flexible as possible, it's a good thing. Thank you. Dr. Kana, are you able to weigh in? Yeah. Good afternoon. Hi, Dr. Sharp. Hello. So I think this is great. I like the idea of telehealth restrictions being removed for licensed providers. I just want to make sure we're seeing license somewhere. Uh, but I do believe that nursing reach outs and pharmacy social work are incredibly useful in managing patients with chronic disease and with COVID in particular, which is the instigator of all these activities. So I'm really happy that we're doing this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Peggy, uh, Peggy Funk. Okay, um, I have this on mute. Um, Sherry, Sherry Nickerson, um, any thoughts here? Hi, I am actually just, just watching and not, don't intend to give uh, feedback at this point. Very good. Um, Tricia, any, do, is this something, any remarks to this particular general finding? So uh, uh, with regards to moving um, provider types, yeah. um, I'm just trying to think exactly what, what folks are referencing here. I don't think we limit on provider types. Um, again, uh, you know, generally our restrictions have been mostly on the originating site. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, some of the waivers actually expanded uh, provider types to include social workers, um, you know, other providers that historically um, weren't using um, telehealth, so um, or weren't eligible to, to use telehealth. Um, but so, um, thank you very much for your feedback. Um, any other comments or concerns here on this particular um, policy discussion item? Hey, David. This is David Cooney from the MIA. Hello, David. Hey, I, I just wanted to point out um, that for the, you know, the topic here is removing telehealth restrictions on provider types. So in the commercial market, the statute doesn't include express um, restrictions on provider types, but it leaves it up to the carriers to determine what's medically appropriate. And that a general finding B is talking about that there was consensus that um, uh, it should be left to clinical judgment of licensed healthcare providers um, and you also mentioned that the proposed legislation addresses this issue. So I just kind of want to point out that for the commercial market, it would still be left up to the um, medical necessity determinations of the carrier and not to the, um, the provider based on existing law. Um, Ava, do you want to make sure you specifically um, note that point? Okay, and we can, doesn't have to be within this document, but we want to, David brings up a very good point. Um, okay, David, one other quick, uh, sorry, it's Lori again, just, and Tricia can probably speak to this because I'm not sure, um, but one of the things that has come up before in conversations in the behavioral health uh, space is the, um, the role of either um, alcohol and drug trainees, clinicians that are on the way to being fully um, licensed or um, graduate um, social workers, um, professional counselors, and that sort of thing. I'm not sure if there's any pro prohibition right now on telehealth by those individuals, but they, they perform quite a lot of services in our outpatient settings. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anyone else before we, we move on? So just you, you want me to, uh, I'll be happy to comment on that piece of it. Yeah, I mean, it, just in general, um, 
we we don't pay um, non-licensed providers. It's just it's not a telehealth issue. This is a, a you know an issue just within general of who we allow to bill Medicaid. You can have students, but you have to bill through a licensed um, professional. Um, who is enrolled in Medicaid. We don't allow them to bill separately. So again, I just want to make sure that's clear that that's not an issue that's specific to telehealth. Um, thank you. And uh, Peggy, are you able, I, I see you were trying to unmute. Are you, are you able to unmute now? Yes, can you hear me? Indeed, good afternoon. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was having a little bit of trouble there. Um, so, I mean, our comments are pretty much that, uh, you know, we agree with what others said, don't really have anything to add other than I uh, just wanted to reiterate that um, this does help certainly with um, reducing hospital admissions. Very good point. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Um, Ava, can I get you to scroll down a little bit? Okay. Number five is um, the, the key category is reducing or waiving cost sharing for telehealth services to the end of the PHE um, or the end of uh, 2021, whichever occurs uh, last. And uh, you'll see here that there is um, additional, while letter A repeats, there's also one additional item um, to note, and that is the second uh, sub bullet point around federal requirements on high deductible plans may impact on flexibility to make changes. I think this is a good point. I believe we've heard it from several payers at this point. Um, perhaps I could invite um, Deb Rifkin, if you're still available, uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more for some of the folks who might not be as familiar with it as the payers are. Yeah, you can't um, generally for non-preventative services, uh, if you're on a high deductible, um, HSA plan, um, your, you have to, your services have to go towards the deductible. And it's pretty, it's pretty simple. I mean, we, we've had it in a million bills. Um, I'm, I'm hoping everyone's pretty familiar with that. You just can't decide that certain things are going to be before deductible or after deductible in an HSA plan, um, even if it's telehealth or not. Understood. Thank you. Um, so let me see if there are others who want to weigh in at this point on this particular item. Um, and maybe I'll invite um, Jim Goodman and then Robin Elliott. Uh, I'm not sure I have much on this point. I just want to get back to the phrasing that you had before on based on consumer preference. That is just a real important point to keep in whatever we put out because we don't want to see uh, services rammed into uh, people who don't want them delivered in that way. Yes, good point. Thank you. Um, Robin, are you able to weigh in here? Yeah, um, I'll just say, I, you know, I think this particular issue, it's, it's um, one that we should still be discussing, but really in context of looking at access in terms of some of the other issues that we talked about earlier. Um, and really trying to figure out um, where, what are the sort of priorities and making sure um, continues. Okay, um, very good. That's um, something we need to be mindful of. Um, anyone else have thoughts here? Hey, David, it's Debbie again. Hey, Debbie. Can you, the only thing I just want to say, and I think I've said it before, and I'm hoping um, a statement here um, will cover it. I, I'm really concerned that we would change cost share for a type of service over a different service. So for example, right now for COVID related services, it's, there's no cost share for either a telehealth visit or an in-person visit. And I'm really um, uncomfortable. And so I just wanna make sure everybody hears it, that we would have a different cost sharing arrangement for some type of service versus a different one. Um, and so I would still argue like moving forward that it would say that for a, you know, um, so a COVID related service, there'd be no, because I think that's really what is in the, um, the PHG, that there would be no cost share, regardless of setting. Um, so 
I, I really have a problem with this. I'm hoping that B either could be fleshed out a little bit more or that's what you really mean when you say differing cost sharing requirements for an in-office visit versus a telehealth visit may have disproportionate effects because we shouldn't be promoting one type of service over another. Yeah, understood. Thank you for um, that feedback. Um, others here before we move along? Okay. Um, let's go on to um, the last one, uh, Ava. Let's scroll down to number six. And in this one, it, it's, it centers around um, the use of technology and HIPAA compliance. And it reads, reinstating technology standards that require providers to use HIPAA compliant technologies, which were relaxed by OCR during the, the public health emergency. If you recall that the, the um, Office of Civil Rights is not enforcing or they're using enforcement discretion on the use of non-public facing applications to support telehealth. Um, this was widely um, praised by lots of healthcare providers because it gave them quick access to ramp up to diffuse telehealth when, uh, when, the, when the pandemic uh, was first, really the onset of it in, in March. Um, many have said they would not have been able to, to treat or would essentially had to go home because they weren't able to um, be able to evaluate and select more of the um, the EHR based applications in a short period of time. So there was a lot of praise around um, you, the OCR for going this route. And there has been some concern amongst uh, folks about privacy and security and the risk of using um, non public facing applications to, um, you know, to, to, to use these applications and the risk of potential um, breaches. And then there have been a lot of others that had said, um, look, um, you know, this is consumer driven and um, the consumers are comfortable with it. Um, let's not put in place a requirement that makes it almost unobtainable if consumers have to start downloading applications and um, if providers have to now go out and contract. Um, so it wasn't widely uh, supported. And what we saw through the quadrants and the general themes, the primary themes is that um, just allow what is in place to exist until the PHE concludes and not necessarily impose any additional requirements or changes, if you will, um, one way or the other. Um, that was the general uh, themes would have emerged as a general finding. So I would open that up for um, thoughts um, from the, the, the work group at this point and um, perhaps um, you know, there's been some thoughts. So Pam um, Case Meyer, are you able to, to weigh in? Okay. Um, w once again, <laughs> finding my mute was a little, I get stuck. Um, you'd think by now I'd have it done. Um, um, <sighs> You know, all of this becomes a little um, challenging to sort out um, given timeframes, as I think I keep raising timeframes relative to the public emergency versus moving forward. Obviously, privacy and compliance and all of those issues are very important long term. But I also think that we are beginning to redefine and reevaluate how they apply and what how it works and what other protections we can put in place. Um, so I do think that it does make some sense to have some discretion um, related to this um, as we continue to discuss the other component parts of this. This is something that always has to be kept in mind. Um, but I don't think it's a cut and dry answer either because I think it, it plays into the other themes and other issues we've been working on. Understood. Um, Dr. Burma. Sorry, same as uh, with um, others. So, so I, I agree with what Pam said. It's, it's a complicated question. We wanna protect um, patients' privacy. Um, at the same time, um, if we provide informed consent to patients and they are willing to use um, non-HIPAA compliant technology um, uh, and that uh, enhances access to services, it seems that um, it makes sense. 
Um, but in general, I do think that people's uh, privacy does need protected and does need protection. Um, and I would agree as an overall statement with um, what um, has been said in terms of uh, the general findings um, with, um, as you have said so well before, David, um, ongoing um, studies as appropriate. Cool. And uh, thank you, Dr. Berman. Uh, Richard Block, are you able to weigh in? I, I weigh, I'll weigh in, David, because you asked, but I think the comments that Paul just made uh, are particularly uh, relevant. Uh, I think most people would agree that the HIPAA compliance is probably appropriate for the protection of privacy and confidentiality. And one more comment. I'd be interested to know, um, Allison Taylor, are you able to, to weigh in? And maybe we lost her along the way. Um, okay. Um, anyone feel that what we have here is um, uniquely misaligned to the primary themes or they have a different position that we should um, consider at this stage for discussion amongst the members here? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> let's, uh, that concludes on the key policy questions. Let's talk a little bit about um, next steps and uh, where we go from here. Uh, we, we've mentioned a couple of times and uh, that there's a potential legislation that's, um, that we don't know yet and others probably don't know that will um, be made as it relates to telehealth. We are aware of the Senate bill, which is again, publicly available. Um, that is an opportunity for stakeholders to, um, to weigh in as well. Um, in addition to uh, the comments that we've received through this process, um, what we plan to do is um, take the summary of the meeting and uh, make modifications to the, the, the key policy category, general findings is appropriate. And uh, as Ben mentioned, I, I keep coming back to that because um, it, ideally it's better to have um, more, more alignment among stakeholders than less. Um, I feel like by and large, um, there, is, there is more alignment and then there is disagreement. I don't know that we could say everyone agrees 100% with everything that's in the general findings, but I think it's fair to say that um, there's a good deal of support for what's been proposed um, in the um, general findings category. We were as staff planning to release a summary document, which essentially um, is the key policy categories, what you all have seen today here, because um, we know that there's a lot of movement in Annapolis and amongst stakeholders to push forward with telehealth. And while this is all publicly available anyway on our website and through redistribution through the members here today, uh, we'd also like to be able to add a little bit of detail around these points. And then at the same time, we would plan to propose a bit more comprehensive um, document um, in the, in the, that would follow probably in a, in a month, a little over a month, but release the key policy categories in the next week to 10 days that you see here with some, a little bit of detail. Um, there's, that's really the, the thinking behind um, what we see as a, as a next step. Um, we're not sure at this stage, I would say that we, we have not planned for additional meetings for the telehealth policy work group, but um, that there could be additional meetings. So as always, please stay tuned um, for that. If there's an additional item that we've not considered, we want to come back to you all. And to the extent we can do that virtually uh, via email, um, that too may save us from convening. Uh, we've had um, a good show of, of participants today, about 51. And I think that in each of these meetings, we've had upwards of 50 to 75 plus. So um, that's a good sign of the support and interest in the stakeholders to have that many participants take part in the meeting. Um, and before we um, wind down, I would like to invite our executive director um, to make some general comments. Ben. Uh, uh, thank you, David, and thank you, the work group, for uh, uh, sticking with this uh, over the last uh, three months. Uh, I think we've gotten good, some good uh, sense of where the um, 
where there's agreement, uh, where there's uh, where there are going to be challenges, uh, and what I would say is that you know, I've said this at the start that we need to we should look um, forward uh, as we think of uh, telehealth policies in the state uh, post pandemic that uh, we uh, key um, principles I think is that we have broader access uh, we have uh, to the extent we can. Uh, enable patients to access telehealth uh, the way they would like, but also recognize that uh, there's appropriate uh, modalities are going to have to be weighed based on the conditions uh, that are being uh, considered and the specialties of the uh, providers delivering care. Uh, clearly, I was um, I thought that Lori and Sally Ann made some good points about. Uh, why um, audio only might work better for um, for behavioral health services than somatic services, and that's something uh, we might want to consider uh, as we go forward, especially given the significant uh, deficits in providers uh, in those areas of care. The area we haven't talked about um, is you know, certainly reimbursement, which is the uh, 800 pound gorilla uh, in this room, uh, which is you know, what is driving you know, much of much of the concern, and it's not something that should be discounted. Uh, clearly, uh, new models of of care, uh, value based models, uh, will make some of these issues go away. That's my hope, uh, and. Uh, we will be left then with the most important issues, which are what's most um, appropriate for patients uh, and uh, what, what can be delivered effectively by providers as the um, key uh, residuals that we all can agree are uh, issues we have to address. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, the commission has not uh, taken uh, any position on um, any, any uh, legislation at this point. Uh, there's a great deal of interest uh, uh, in this area witnessed by uh, Commissioner uh, Dr. Bandari's participation throughout as well as uh, uh, participation uh, of uh, Dr. Adi, uh, uh, our nurse practitioner uh, representatives have also been uh, heavily engaged and uh, we appreciate that participation, but the interest at the Healthcare Commission is not limited to those two. Uh, so I think we will have some very uh, thoughtful debate among ourselves uh, as well over the next month at, uh, at our public uh, and legislative meetings. So thank you very much for your diligence uh, in this entire period. And we look forward to working with you over the coming months as uh, we work to, to um, solutions for all Marylanders. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, so with that, we will give everyone back um, 25 minutes of their time this afternoon. And just to um, sort of uh, say what Ben said, thank you all for a uh, number of meetings and number of much of your time. Um, it's been very informative process and we're very grateful for your willingness to help us out. So um, with that, um, everyone um, have a safe and enjoyable evening and we look forward to talking with you in one form or fashion in the, in the not too distant future. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. See ya. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.